Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're coming to you live from the West Coast. Harry and Jenny in the Seattle area, our guest Carl Palachek down in California. So for us, it's lunch. Over in Europe, it's early in the evening, and over in Asia, it's very, very early in the morning. And we have everybody from uh, around the world, so thank you for joining us. This uh, I'm going to take a moment here. This is a, a special uh, event. This is the kickoff of Winter Quarter, and this is the MSP Tech Talk series. Here's what we found last year, is that you have a hunger for bona fide academic content that, yes, it's, it's underwritten by our generous supporters to make it happen. We're going to talk about that, but more importantly, you like the idea of a six-week quarterly system. So we're going to have Winter Quarter, Spring Quarter, summer quarter and fall quarter this year and mix up the topics and keep it fresh. So you've already seen that on the agenda um, because you would have signed up for this. Today we're talking service agreements with Carl Palachek. We'll get to that in a moment. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. Next week is a double hitter. So we will have the Wednesday webinar, which is I'm presenting and it's on analytics, five things you can do as an MSP. So I know you'll be there for that. And then we're also going to have a business webinar from our friends over at Intuit who have some interesting workflow inroads on the business side and how MSPs can play in their reindeer games. So that's next Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, with that said, use the question and answer feature to, uh, to ask your questions. I will be the one that will repeat those uh, for Carl as, as we go along. And without further ado, uh, Carl, uh, sir, you're out there. Are you in Sacramento, California today? Or I think you have you already traveled to Southern California for an event you speak at tomorrow, I believe. So I'm in Sacramento now. So this was my super busy day. This is, I know the year is young, but this is the busiest day in a long time. This is my second webinar of the day. And uh, I had a meeting with uh, some employees, new employees this morning, and then I'm traveling this afternoon. So <laughs> I will I will rest my head in Anaheim tonight. Okay, sir. Well, I'll tell you what, let's, uh, let's, let's click to the next screen because I, I do want to make a few comments about why we're here, how we're here. And, and folks, uh, give a fair shake to Fortinet, longtime sponsor of the MSP Tech Talk series. And they're having conversations in the SMB sector. We had a great focus group back in December. It's like putting the band back together from the old SBS days. And quite frankly, we offered some brutal feedback to Fortinet. They've hung in there. And 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 I guess the idea, Carl, and 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 let me do a, a sense check is, you know, I'm trying to position this as maybe the long play national public radio format where we have generous sponsors who underwrite this, but they also understand the nature of the audience and quite quite frankly, what their role is in the community. Does that, Carl, does that, you know, maybe you can articulate it better. <laughs> well, that is, you know, what's interesting is that is so accurate that I did not know until this morning that Fortinet was the sponsor. So I, you know, if, if anybody, thinks that any of the content was in any way influenced by it, I assure you it was not. So that I won't say, <laughs> you know, there's nothing here that, uh, you know, I guess really speaks one way or the other about Fortinet, but, you know, truly the sponsor could have been somebody that, you know, is much, is extremely relevant to the content. And I would not have known that in the preparation of the content. So. Cool. I, I and we'll have a Fort, Carl, we'll have a Fortinet moment at midpoint. Um, so why don't we jump into the, it, with, with, with that all said, why don't we jump into the good stuff? I'm going to hand you the talking stick. I believe you're going to introduce yourself, Carl Palachek, for people who do not know Carl. Let's rock. Exactly. Well, thank you. So I am uh, the author of a couple of uh, books, about a dozen and a half books now. And uh, most recently, like we are literally in the still in the the, the final stages of, of birthing the service agreements for SMB consultants. This is available in you know several formats on my website and will be available on Amazon very shortly. Uh, I have built and sold two successful managed service businesses in Sacramento, California, and currently spend my time blogging and podcasting and speaking and training and stuff like that. And in my spare time, writing books. So I think, 
I might, I might be approaching getting tied with Harry in the number of books uh, introduced into the world. So, no, that's right. And Carl, what what we're going to do is make sure with the thank you and follow up uh, that goes out after the webinar that there'll be a discount code for your books and the opportunity for people to uh, avail themselves of that. But hey, Carl, before you you you, you go to the next slide, uh, you're a road warrior. Can you give us? just kind of a sense in the next couple of months, one or two cities or a handful of cities you'll be in, then we'll jump into it. Oh yeah. So I'm going to be, you know, I don't know why Anaheim and Orange County is so popular, but uh, I've got events down there. ASCII's going to be down there. And then I'm doing stuff with our good friends at Channel Pro in Dallas. And I'm kicking off my 2018 SMB Roadshow in Phoenix. So you know, I've got I've got some travel booked. It's funny, I just recently booked all my travel through the end of May, uh, so my my wallet is officially empty. There you go, my friend. All right, sounds good. All righty. So um, <clears throat> today, what we're going to do, we're going to talk a bit about service agreements, and you know, the theme is that service agreements are not about service. And and, and what I mean by that, and you'll you'll see the details of this is that so many people think that the service agreement is about I'm going to provide four hours every month for free and then the price is going to be this price after that and you know here's what's included and I make the very very strong argument in my book and in my presentation that the the, the details of what you deliver are stapled to the back of the service agreement it is it is almost irrelevant whether you are providing cloud services or managed services or blocks of time or project labor, uh, those are the details that are not particularly important in the service agreement. So we're gonna talk about why you need service agreements and what they actually do for you and for your company and for your clients and why um, from now on, you never get to say, I don't sign service agreements because you absolutely have to sign service agreements. So. First, a little disclaimer. I think we had a disclaimer the last time I presented on your <laughs> um, webinar. Sir, when you buy me a beer at the bar, you have a disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm responsible for my own Uber and driving and all that, but go on. <laughs> exactly. So, so I'm not an attorney and this isn't legal advice. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about you know, the very practical businessy side of all of this. And, and you know, in, in my book, the, at the bottom of every single page, it says you should have an attorney review every document you sign. So, you know, um, I'm going to give you advice, but take my advice and a big grain of salt and take it to your attorney and, uh, and have them review things you sign. So a couple of definitions. Uh, Carl, again, can I add? Uh, yeah, let me just add one more point to that. Um, Folks, what I do, and, and this, this kind of relates to actually reading the agreements you work with, which is equally important. And Carl, I don't know if you know this trick because I have ADHD, but if you hold down the Windows key and the Enter key, uh, you bring up Narrator, and Narrator will read the document back to you, right, which is, ah. which is r really important because you know we impute what we want to see when we read a lengthy document, especially an agreement, and to have it read back to you, 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 you catch things. But, but go on, it's my little oh, secret on yeah. how to read big documents. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can watch TV while you're doing it. So, there you go. So uh, basically, a service agreement is a document that outlines the relationship between a client and a service provider. I mean, that's it, beginning and middle and end, that's kind of what it does. A service level agreement is a little bit different in that it defines this relationship, but it also guarantees certain response times and returns money to the client if the guarantees are not met. So we're gonna talk, we're gonna get back to the specifics of this, but there is a difference between them and I want to be really clear, I personally don't use the term SLA because I don't want it to be confused. I don't ever want to be confused with somebody who will give you your money back, right? So uh, let's be clear about that. So there's several types of contracts or service agreements. First of all, we're 
all familiar with the kind of the one page, two page terms of service. This basically says, I promise I'm going to send you a bill. You promise you're going to pay it. Uh, here's the, the interest rate if you don't and so forth. It basically, it's enough so that you've got a formal relationship. <clears throat> then a contract is a bit longer because a contract is going to go into much more of the actual relationship between you and the client. And it's going to give kind of a sense of what's going on. So the, the credit app or the one page terms is something that I used to always just put a little bunch of those in a folder and give them to my technicians. And if they went out to a brand new client that we'd never serviced before, and we know they're not going to sign a contract, we still have them. We hand them this and they sign a copy of it and the technician gives them a copy to keep and they bring it back to our office. And then, and that way we've got the basics covered. And it's a super easy thing to do. Um, next, the contract is probably six or seven pages for most people. And what we do, what I recommend is that you execute managed services or cloud services as an addendum to your primary contract. So the reason for that is that basically, let's say the contract says that your rate is $120 an hour, okay? Uh, under managed services, you'll say, okay, you get this flat fee and you get this other stuff. Anything not covered under managed services is gonna be at the regular contract rate. So as an addendum, you basically say, if it's not covered under managed services, it, it goes back to that contract that we are amending with our managed service agreement or amendment. Uh, same thing with cloud services. <clears throat> And then you have hardware as a service. So if you're involved with hardware as a service, basically you finance hardware and it, it's in your name, your company's name, you provide it to a client, you charge them a service fee um, and you own that equipment. Uh, and so that's a different kind of animal from these other agreements because you've actually got to deal with ownership of uh, hardware and software and how that's provided to the client. So that's a different kind of contract. And then you have specialty contracts. So very often the specialty contracts are going to be um, longer term, right? For a phone system frequently, you're gonna have a three year minimum. For a BDR, you might have three years to pay off the backup and disaster recovery device and so forth. Uh, usually those specialty contracts are something that you're able to get sample language from a vendor in order to be able to uh, provide those contracts. So the first thing you have to figure out is who you are. That is, is your business a sole proprietor, an S corp, an LLC, whatever. And the reason that this matters and it's worth having this discussion, don't, don't have this discussion on a Facebook forum or uh, you know, Reddit or something like that and make a, a permanent business decision based on that. Go talk to your enrolled agent or your accountant or your bookkeeper, somebody who actually understands the implications of this. And in the new tax law, if you paid any attention to the debate as it was going on last month, it was all about, you know, well, how are we going to tax corporations and are we going to give this special, uh, you know, option for sole proprietors or small S corps and pass throughs and blah, blah, blah. This is not a simple matter. So in terms of taxation, how you structure your business matters a lot. And the amount of money at in question is potentially huge. So and I'll just give the perfect example. I am an S corp at least now I haven't, <laughs> I haven't had that conversation with my accountant for the year, but today I'm an S corp and have been for whatever, 10 years, 15 years. Um, and primarily because I pay myself a salary of $60,000. So that's what I make. If anybody asks you, that's what I make in a year. I pay myself a salary of 60,000 and I pay myself social security. I pay social security taxes on 60,000. Everything I make above that is uh, still taxable at whatever rate, but I don't pay the social security taxes on it. So that saves me about 14% of 
however much money I make above 60,000. Again, I'm not a tax attorney, so you know, you need to talk to your tax accountant about this. And all of the rules changed <laughs> January 1st. And so um, even, even your enrolled agent may not know what those rules are yet because they haven't, they have to go back and do hours and hours of training and get the new books. And you know, they haven't even printed the books yet. So lots of lots of important information has to go into this decision. Carl, what, what I would also add is there's a couple of people on the line that are going to be thinking ter in terms of capitalization tables and acquisitions. And um, there's also implications in terms of like if you want to have a stock option pool, which, which can be used as a recruiting uh, inducement or incentive to get top talent. Now, it may not apply so much in our space, but for example, a sole proprietor format isn't going to have that capability um, right. an LLC does. And, and typically, Carl, you, you, you slap about 10% of the outstanding uh, equity over into a stock option pool, that kind of thing. So that's, that's a much, much longer conversation, but, but these are the kind of things you need to think about if you want to take care of the people that take care of you, that helped you build your business. And when you get acquired, you know, you don't want to see them have sort of a, a, a frowny face because they didn't get to participate. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, the other thing is that as a sole proprietor, you literally, your business is run on your personal social security number. And that's, that is your, um, you know, your tax entity. And I, you know, I've known businesses, I've had clients that have 50 employees and they are running as a sole proprietorship. So it can be done, but uh, you know, the, each of these has restrictions of what you can and can't do legally, you know, in terms of like, if you have a home office, um, as a sole proprietor, you can take that. As an S Corp, uh, there are some different rules about being able to make money off of uh, an entity you, that you own, your house. So you have to be careful about that. And again, you know, you're going to, I love getting advice from people who know what they're talking about. So, so uh, Hank, my tax man, uh, is a very good friend of mine because uh, he keeps me on the straight and narrow. The other thing is that you have to be careful whenever you're engaged in business of getting your personal stuff mixed up with your client's personal stuff. So even as a sole proprietor, you need contracts that separate, you know, what your relationship looks like. And you do not want, again, your house, your car, your, your retirement to be on the line because of something that happened in your business. S-Corps, LLCs, you know, all of those entities other than sole proprietorships try to create what they call a corporate veil that separates you from that stuff. But having said that, if you don't treat your S Corp like an S Corp, if you move money back and forth between your personal and your business accounts every 20 minutes and you buy a bunch of stuff for home from the S Corp account and you basically don't maintain them separately, then it becomes easy for someone to what they call pierce the corporate veil and come after your personal stuff. And uh, on a side note, the closest analogy I can think to how messy this gets is if you've ever been a landlord, <laughs> there is no limit to how messy other people's lives can get. And, you know, getting their stuff mixed up with your stuff is always to be avoided if you can. So make a, a conscious decision. Don't just continue doing what you did last year, especially in this huge uh, tax change year. This is a great opportunity for you to sit down with your accountant and talk about you know what you really should be doing going forward and you know in some states it's very expensive in i don't know what it costs in in washington in california i pay an 800 dollars tax every year for the just the, the sheer joy of being an s corp <laughs> uh so or and the same is true with an llc and and any other corporation yeah yeah we're i i don't even think we have a fee carl up here. Yeah. Um, I'm shooting from the hip and I've done a couple deals up here, but that was one of the, in fact, it was one of them was with a group from California and we incorporated in the state of Washington for some of those very reasons. Of that. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> well, I, can, 
I can certainly understand that. So, I mean, that's, you know, and, and there's some places where, you know, it's a hundred, hundred twenty-five dollar filing fee, but then there's no ongoing taxes and so forth. So anyway, find out about it and, you know, don't make the decision based on, you know, a hundred dollars versus two hundred dollars, but look at the bigger picture of, of you know, because when you talk about some of these decisions are thousands and thousands of dollars every year. And, um, you know, I would say that Hank has helped me through the S Corp to save uh, on a couple different occasions. I can point to 15 or $20,000 in taxes by making the correct decision. So, you know, just, just keep that in mind. It's well, also well, important. Well, yeah, Carl, one of the thing is that, um, and, and again, I'm kind of, I, I'm overshooting the mark here, but it's it's interesting context that if you go do uh, an investment round, um, probably not so much with angel money, but if if you start talking VC money and uh, private equity money, um, you'll probably reincorporate. So there's there's going to be when when you get to the big leagues, Carl, that's when you start doing this kind of this nonsense about a Delaware corporation and different right. classes of stock and preferred. Um, it's you, folks, you'll know it when you see it, you'll know it when you need it. Don't get, don't get, you know, rung around the axle today over all that stuff, but it's, it's a complex area and, and you'll know when you're in the big leagues. In fact, you may even raise your hand in one of those meetings and say, I'm out of my league. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, all right, please all right, continue. So, yeah. So, um, the main thing to remember is that all business relationships are in fact legal relationships right so you know if you think about it you know the yo's here on the radio these ads you know if you die without a will the government's going to decide what happens with your money well you know what if you operate your business without a contract then the government is also going to decide so you know your state your city your county your country has laws about how interactions between people work Contracts are, in fact, about how we work with each other. And Harry and I have done, I don't know, a thousand, literally a thousand projects over the years. And we've signed a contract, I don't know, maybe three times. But all those other deals that we've done, hey, I'll do this if you'll do that. And, you know, do you want to work together on this? And, you know, whatever. That's all, you know, handshake, word of mouth, all of that. Well, if something were to go wrong, trust me. Lawyers would get involved and they would look at the laws of whichever states and they would decide the way things are going to go. Now, if you have a contract, you can shortcut that and say, you know, for example, if you're having work done in your yard, you say, look, we're going to go to arbitration. So if there's a, a question about what this and that, we're not going to go to lawyers, we're going to go to the arbiter, right? You can put that into a contract and then it becomes binding that somebody else has to do that. So, you know, there is a powerful reason to sign a contract simply to protect yourself from just the, you know, the, the world of business and the fact that you don't control it if you don't sign a contract. So um, big picture, what a contract or a service agreement does for you is uh, it allows you to establish rates. Uh, and Washington State, I happen to know because I had a client there, um, You there's a limit on how much interest you can charge in Washington State unless you have a signed contract. So I think the limit's 12%. So if you want to charge 18%, you have to have a signed contract. So things like that, uh, you can set those rates. You can also set expectations. So you can say that we're going to provide these services and it's going to be in this price range. Um, the, all of that can be in there. <clears throat> you also can specifically limit your liability. My my favorite clause in my contract is this big paragraph that basically says, I'm not responsible for anything I do, <laughs> right? Um, and that's legally binding because they signed it, right? So so you can, uh, and you have to have some reasonable limits, but you know, you can limit your liability. And uh, most importantly, it, it covers taxes and we're going to come back to that. But, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, if you don't lay out <clears throat> the fact that you are a contractor and that, uh, you know, certain things have been met, then your, em your clients can be considered your employers and they can be held liable for your taxes. So you need to avoid that. So 
you know, if you think about your personal life, you know, uh, you park your car, they hand you a ticket and it's got one point type, but on the back of it, it all the rules and regulations of the contract that you have entered into. You open software, there's a contract, right? There's all kinds of stuff. Um, and in your business life, you, you have a contract with the phone company and the internet service provider and whoever cleans your office and rent and, you know, whatever. There's just contracts everywhere. And so, you know, I hear people at conferences say, oh, well, my customers would never sign contracts and they trust me and they just want to do everything on a handshake and whatever. That's all great. Um, but in the real world, your customers sign contracts all the time in every part of their business every day. And just having you come up to, um, you know, the modern era is not a big deal and don't have both sides of that conversation. Let the client have their part of it. So <clears throat> there's lots of things that you can offer your clients. You can decide whether you want to do hourly or, um, just have a basic credit agreement, right? That would be the minimum I would do. Um, do contracts for various things, fixed rates and all that. There's lots and lots of options and uh, whatever you wanna do is fine. But again, this gets into the decide who you are and what you wanna do and then decide what you wanna sell and finally who you wanna sell it to. The contract, the service agreement is literally where who you are and who your clients are and what you sell comes together, right? It is the definition of what that relationship is going to look like. So, you know, you should uh, think of it in those terms and say, all right, so this, this contract doesn't have to be 50 pages. It doesn't have to cover every microscopic detail. It is the big picture of our relationship. So, um, yeah. Now, now, Carl, on the, the who you are, by the way, Carl, we're almost at the, uh, the, yep. the, the bottom of the hour, folks. Be sure to use the questions uh, capability in your control panel to ask questions. But Carl, on the, I, I, I mean, I'm being a little facetious, but on the who you are, I've had investors in the past with new ideas and startups ask me, you know, Harry, what do you want to do with your life? And, and, and I want to kind of reply, well, it's not relevant. I mean, to, to be honest, I want to be a parking lot attendant in Crest of Butte, Colorado, and get a free ski pass. I mean, if you're <laughs> if if you're going to go there, <laughs> Make my dreams come not, true. Not, not not really relevant. I know that's not your intent, Carl, but you you'd be surprised how I've had investors kind of ask, and I, I they, they they're kind of what they want to hear is that you wake up and breathe. Uh, uh, call center development, you, you, what, what, whatever the deal is, they, they, they want to hear that that's what you wake up in the morning thinking. That may be true, that may not be true, but it's always a funny question because it's like, that's irrelevant, what I want to do with my life at that level. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, just what being you a wise your business. Yeah. Being um, a wise acre. Uh, Go ahead. The, the important thing is that you you should be able to change what you offer people without making mm -hmm significant changes to your agreement. And a perfect example is for those people who, so right now I'm teaching a class on managed services a month and I hand out uh, my sales sheet for <clears throat> per device pricing and then my sales sheet for per user pricing and then my sales sheet for the cloud five pack, right? Which is a completely different set of offerings. But I have gone to clients and literally stapled each one of those to the exact same contract because the contract covers just enough to manage the relationship and not all of the, the details. Uh, probably the biggest thing that you have to be very aware of when you write something that way is to say, you know, you have to, you have a choice. If you amend this, will the amendment supersede the original contract or will the, uh, contract supersede the amendment, right? And you always want the amendments to supersede the contract. That way you can make some changes uh, in that. Um, so, all right. So Fortinet is our sponsor and um, we're at the we bottom have, of the hour. We're at the bottom of the hour. Uh, and Carl, I think we're going to watch a little NFL football. Um, Carl, I don't all know right. if you can saw 
that yeah. Minnesota game the other day. You probably heard. We're, we're not watching the Minnesota game, folks, but just to get back in the mood. <laughs> um, I, I don't know if you saw or heard, but boy, howdy, that 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 that, that was epic. I just happened to have it on. Thank God. <laughs> so, All right, Carl. Go so for I'm, I'm going to play this, and um, I believe if people are dialed in by phone, they're not going to hear it. Is that correct? Correct, folks. You do need to use your computer speakers. Please turn on your computer speakers. Maybe take your telephone headset off for a second. The audio is via computer. Carl, let's rock. All righty. And thank you, Forty Net. Waiting for Back. And boy, that is uh, that's timely because Carl, the other great game actually involved the Pittsburgh Steelers last weekend. So uh, that's well, that's that's a timely thing, folks. I'm going to host a football watching party for the Seattle Seahawks this weekend in the playoffs. If you're in the area, you, oop, oop. Okay, we got a poll. Okay, folks, if you could answer the poll. Uh, the poll is, do you offer security services and products as a significant part of your business? The answer is yes and no. Uh, folks, while you're answering that, of course, the Seattle Seahawks didn't make the playoffs. It's a sort of it's a local choke. Um, and please uh, feel free to use the question capability to ask your questions. And once again, next week, we have MSP Tech Talk next Wednesday. I am the presenter on MSP Analytics. And then the following day, we have a business workflow conversation with our good friends at Intuit. So with that said, Jenny or Carl, go ahead and close the poll, and I'll read the results. Uh, I don't know if I know how to do that. There we go. Oh, okay. And I'm actually going to cut off my speaker. Uh, the results are 71% yes, you offer a security service and uh 29% no. Carl, go ahead and uh, take the screen back and let's jump into the uh, the presentation, my friend. All right. Can you see my question screen? I can, sir. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, if there are no questions, we'll keep moving on. But if questions come up, you can interrupt me as needed. Uh, okay. If I have permission, sir, you can count on me. Let's continue. <laughs> The only time I'm ever interrupt driven is when I'm making a presentation. So uh, I just wanted to go through the second section here on, on the webinar, um, 10 quick tips about uh, putting together your service agreements. The first thing uh, is that when you sign a, a service agreement with somebody who has already been a client, uh, no matter what you're doing, just make sure you start out by saying that, that, that we're going to this is going to replace every previous agreement we had. And there's lots of reasons for this, but, you know, people will write things at the bottom of checks uh, or they will uh, put an, a note on an invoice that they've paid or you will put a paragraph at the bottom of an invoice, which, you know, may or may not be legally binding, whatever. But, you know, you, you just need to basically have a period where you say, clear out all that stuff that might be considered part of this contract, make it go away. This now is our contract moving forward. Uh, and then you should have, uh, I think, a minimum term. So in my case, um, you know, there's always this debate about what kind of contracts should you have in order to maximize your value if somebody decides to buy your business. Well, I can tell you having sold two managed service businesses, I have always had contracts that expired in 30 days and were automatically renewed. So basically they had a four month minimum in my case and every device put on managed services had a four month minimum. But, uh, you know, I had clients who were with me uh, for 20 years on a month to month contract. So, you know, demonstrating your recurring revenue is far more important than whether you have a, a one month or a three year contract. And the reason for that is simply that, you know, it is about relationships. If the relationship goes south, people are going to get out of their contracts, period. And so that term has only minimal meaning. Um, and if you decide that you're going to fight somebody getting out of a contract, you could just waste massive amounts of money uh, not getting anywhere. Because at the end of the day, if I stop paying you, you're going to stop giving me service. 
And if you stop giving me service, I'm going to stop paying you. So contracts can come to an end simply because they uh, are broken. And, and the re it's the relationship that's broken before the contract is broken. So, you know, this is a formal thing that has to do with the IRS and taxes and that kind of stuff. And it is not really about the actual, um, you know, whether or not you're going to force somebody to stay in a relationship. Well, Carl, I let, let's uh, you, you know me. I just like to take left turns in these things. So it's like a it's like a marriage. <laughs> I knew. I almost yeah. said, "Don't you have any comments about divorce?" <laughs> <laughs> it's like a marriage. I've I've been married twenty five years. I've learned a few things along the way. The old, I believe it's Chinese saying, "Happy wife, happy life." So as long as Harry brings home paycheck. <laughs> Let's just say we have agreement, um, and I'll, I'll stop right there before I get in trouble. Please continue. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll save you from this one. Okay, uh, your contract should absolutely have a non-disclosure agreement. So not only should you have non-disclosure agreements with your employees with regard to your intellectual property, but also your employees should have uh, um, uh, their non-disclosure agreement should also cover anything that they see or interact with at the clients. Um, and then your, your contract should basically say, me and my employees are signing a non-disclosure with you. And, you know, it's a little less important that, the, that it goes both ways, but it might as well go both ways. The client will see ways that you operate and forms that you use for documentation and, you know, some of the ways that you do business. And, you know, you don't want them sharing that with the competition. Uh, so that's, that's useful. It's also a good practice. So one, one of the things we do first of the year, I have clients, I have uh, employees renew all of their non-disclosure agreements. And I send a note to clients that say, you know, I'm, I've scanned these in. If you want uh, a copy of these non-disclosure agreements, I'll be happy to give them to you. And every once in a while, I have a client who says, yeah, I think that that's a good idea. I will take an updated uh, copy of those. Uh, next is tax related declarations. And for those of you who are old enough, you'll remember uh, it's now going on 15, almost 20 years. There was a period where all the big IT companies were being sued because they were treating contractors like employees. And so the contractors got together and sued and say, hey, you know what? We should be getting uh, you know, these benefits and those benefits and health insurance and retirement and all this other stuff because the IRS has very clear laws about what constitutes an employee and what constitutes a contractor. And you are treating us like contractors, but you are not giving us the benefits that come with being a contractor. So um, anyway, the courts basically upheld the um, contractors in many of these cases. And so the, if you go to the IRS, if you just Google employee versus contractor designation, you will come up with a, a PDF document that the IRS puts out and they update it from time to time. But they have an entire publication, which is 15A, which is about how you make these determinations, right? And so what we did is basically take their tick list and put it into our contract. So, you know, we, we specifically say, we're going to pay our taxes, you're going to pay your taxes. And, um, you know, the IRS says, hey, if you tell somebody um, which job to do, the order in which to do it, which tools to use, uh, and where they have to do it, right, tick, 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 then they are an employee. So we basically say, we're going to choose which tasks we're going to do, the order in which we're going to do them, how we're going to do them, which tools we're <laughs> going to use, right? We go through all of those tick lists and specifically lay out all of the requirements that the IRS has so that um, as long as uh, somebody signs this contract, um, they never have to worry that they're responsible to pay my taxes. So if you want a good reason why a client should sign a contract with you, not being responsible for your taxes goes a long ways. So uh, you should also be able to, you should have a clause that says, basically, 
if you ask us to do something, we're going to do it and you're going to get a bill. So as bizarre as it sounds, there are clients who say, you know, well, I didn't expect to get a bill for this. And you, you look at them and you're like, are you an idiot? Like you specifically asked me to do this. Well, yeah, but I didn't think that you would charge us for it. Well, what, what part of our relationship makes you think that I'm here to work for your company for free, right? So uh, basically you just need a very simple statement so that there's no doubt about it. It's, it's a fundamental piece of a contract. And then how will you resolve disputes? Now, some people will say, all disputes must go to small claims court or that we will do arbitration. There is an American Arbitration Association that, uh, you know, basically there are a lot of retired uh, lawyers and judges and uh, they will hear your case and um, make decisions and choose on, you know, how things are going to be settled. Um, I have never been sued, but I have been called as an expert witness uh, in a couple of big cases. And I have to tell you, everyone's life would be much better if everybody was just competent and, and well-intentioned, but not everybody is. And, you know, being sued is extremely rare in our business. I mean, you've seen it and I've seen it. Everybody's got a story of walking into an office where uh, the person who left didn't document anything. All the hardware is registered in the the former IT consultant's name, half the services are in their name, the domain name is registered to him, uh, all the software is the illegal, uh, he doesn't give them their passwords, they can't get into the router, they can't get into the firewall, they can't even get into the server, you have to break into that system, and guess what? That guy never gets sued. I know of exactly one case in 23 years where that guy got sued by a client for being an incompetent boob. And, you know, it just doesn't happen. So, you know, you should you should have this in your contract, but don't freak out over it. You know, just well put in a paragraph and deal with it. And and Carl, I would concur in the S and B channel as an MSP, I would say that's a rarity. Now, that said, l l let me offer some context. Um, because as as you know, and I suspect everybody in the community knows, you know, I, I've, I've leaned on uh, long-term employee Jennifer Hallmark over in the radio control room to essentially run SMB Nation day-to-day, -day, which has allowed me to invest in some startups. And I've been part of some startups in Seattle. And uh, boy, howdy, those, those, those are some tough people across the water, Carl. That's the big <laughs> leagues. And, you know, I was in one gig, I will not name, but I was in one gig where the CEO, you know, spent half his time on governance issues and we were VC backed. And dude, I was signing for legal documents from bicycle couriers when he was out of the office. <laughs> <laughs> So I, the, I, I'll get to the point, and, and, and this is a serious point, is that, you know, Carl, you've run a business for 20 plus years, I've run a business for 20 plus years, I've seen it all, in, including lawsuits in a different realm, um, but that's why I'm qualified to be a CEO, and, and, and I would offer you have some similar and, 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 and you know, like, likewise experiences, as everybody on the phone does. So folks, hang your hat on that, that if you've run a business for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you've seen it all. <laughs> right. And you're qualified to be a CEO. Sorry to take a left turn, Carl, back to the slide. <laughs> no, it's all good. So, all right, next thing is uh, limit your liability. So, and this is one where you have to do strategically, right? So basically you say, like, like I say, literally, I make no guarantees or warranties that uh, the system's going to be up. It's going to be functioning. Or, you know, nothing. I, I literally spell that out. And then in the very next paragraph, I say, so here's the deal. Um, in the event that this limitation of damages is held unenforceable, then we're going to agree that all liability to the client is limited to, and then we you, you pick an amount. And you can, what I've settled on is $10,000 or the, the larger amount of $10,000 or um, all the money that you've paid to my company in the last three months, okay? So that's, that number is big enough 
that a judge is going to take it seriously. If you say, uh, you know, my liability is limited to one dollar, the judge is going to say, well, that's just stupid, <laughs> right? Right. And boom, you're done. So uh, then then it's you have unlimited liability. But if you say I'm limiting this to some number that's big enough that it's going to hurt. Well, then a judge is going to take that seriously. And so, you know, don't don't limit it to 100 million because, you know, you, that's it. That's a, that's the same as being unlimited. But, you know, so put a limit on it, but make it a reasonable limit. Uh, none of which keeps you from buying liability insurance or errors and emissions. Um, next, costs. So in the contract, you need to put some base uh, costs, hourly rates, that sort of thing. But this is where it's very important that you be able to say that this can be changed upon a written 30-day notice. OK, so that way and obviously you're not going to raise the rates every 30 days. You're going to raise them once or twice a year or once every other year. You know, most of you on this call uh, probably raise your rates every other year, more or less. So, you know, that's cool. Um, so no one's going to really abuse this. But you what you don't want to do is lock in a cost of, let's say, one hundred dollars an hour for 10 years. <laughs> and some of you have done that. Um, uh, even if you haven't signed a contract, you haven't raised your rates in 10 years. So you need to raise your rates from time to time. And and so you should put some costs in here. But also remember that you're going to take your current offering, staple it to the back of the contract as an amendment and um, specifically call out your current rates. But, you know, the, the success of renewing every 30 days is that um, you, you have to be able to make these changes. Uh, for those of you, for example, who uh, don't don't get paid in advance. It would be great if you could write a 30 day notice and tell your clients that from now on um, you have to you have to prepay for hardware and software. That's a great thing to do at the beginning of the year. If you sent that letter this afternoon, then you could start charging those rates on March 1st. Right. So. All right. <clears throat> Credit terms. So. Whatever your terms happen to be, they should be laid out. And by terms, I mean, you know, uh, for us, labor is net 20 days. Hardware and software have to be prepaid. Projects are paid 50% up front and then milestone payments after that, right? Whatever your terms are, you, they should make sense. They should be logical. One of the advantages of putting them into a contract is that gradually over time, you will begin charging are having the same terms with all of your clients instead of having a mishmash where every client has some unique uh, set of uh, arrangements. Um, you don't want that. You know, consistency is uh, the, the biggest piece of making money sometimes. And finally, end of life. How do you get out of this contract and what happens if somebody cancels? And there's there's really two pieces to that. How you get out, normally you're going to say, well, this contract is good to a certain date and then it expires or it has automatically renewed or whatever. Um, it, there should be a clause that basically says that anybody can get out of this on, you know, certain notice and so forth. You know, you have to give people an out. You can't force them to be on a contract forever. And then um, what happens? So we have a clause that specifically says that if you cancel services with us, then everything we do from that moment on is billable because basically everything becomes an ad move change. So everything related to getting you off of service. So I'm going to charge you to uninstall my antivirus. I'm going to charge you to install a different antivirus. You know, I'm going to sell you something else. I'm going to charge you to take my remote monitoring and patch management agent off. If you want to continue to get Windows updates, I'm going to charge you to turn those back on, right? You know, basically it's all billable. And in our case, we get prepaid for everything. So I'm going to sell you a block of 10 hours and then I'm going to chip away at that uh, for whatever it takes to transition you to another IT consultant. And, you know, what you don't want to do is to have somebody give you notice and then run up a big bill and then never pay it because they don't have a contract with you anymore. And, you know, if you don't like it, you can take them to court, which you won't. 
right? Uh, and so for some people, the only time they've ever lost money in this business is when a client walked away and ran up a bill. So, um, you know, don't, don't let that happen. Just, you know, and, and we also, we literally have people initial this paragraph uh, when they sign up. So they know on day one what's going to happen when, they, when it, it's all over. Yeah, back to my example about marriage. Oh, I better stop. I'm going back on mute. <laughs> All righty. Any questions at this point? Uh, let's see, Carl. Yeah, in all seriousness. Um, folks, I, I do not have questions. Now, please feel free to ask questions. Carl, as you and I know, the nature of, of this kind of presentation doesn't Typically, in my experience, it doesn't lend itself to an overwhelming number of questions because it's a, it's, it's a business topic. It's pretty clear. It's pretty self-explanatory versus, you know, a technical topic. You can't, you can't even get to the questions quick enough. So I'm okay with that. That said, folks, be sure to use the question feature in, the, uh, in your control panel if you have questions. But Carl, the deck is clear. Let's continue. Okay. Well, and also, you know, sometimes people uh, have a question or a comment that say, well, I disagree with this because of whatever. I'm, I'm happy to address disagreements as well. You know, I'm, uh, anyway. So, all right. So again, thank you, Fortinet. And uh, we don't have any more videos. No, but I'll tell you, for people that came, Carl, if you could go back to that for just a second, if you don't mind, and I do have a, a compliment for you that I'll pass on. We finally got a, a, a notation <laughs> up on questions, but um, folks, if you arrive late, again, this is Harry Brailsford and Carl Palachek with the first class of winter quarter in our popular MSP Tech Talk series, and the reason we're here is because we have well-behaved sponsors supporting the SMB channel, like Fortinet, who uh, they're 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 here to help us. And if if you could do a favor and help them, take a look at their offering. Um, we have some other assets up on our YouTube channel, SMB Nation, uh, the YouTube channel. If you'd like to see some other interviews and that kind of thing, appreciate it. Your, your support keeps us on the air, as they say, Carl. Um, please, and, and now, by the way, now we're getting some, some questions. So right. if you don't mind, Carl, yeah, go to the next slide and I'll start to read off what is in my inbox. As it were, uh, we have Matthew uh, Concola uh, just commenting, uh, tip number 10 was the largest eye opener I have never thought about in my 20 years. Tip number 10. Carl, what was tip number 10? <laughs> that, what happens one. when you cancel service? <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, thank uh, you. Brett, Brett, uh, Brett Lard, Brett Leard ask, uh, have you got a sample, have you got sample contracts with all this great stuff rolled in maybe for sale? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Well, Carl, why don't you feel that? <laughs> so, so I was going to do my commercial at the end, but uh, I just released service agreements for SMB consultants, which is, you know, it's a $40 book and it's available at SMB books. You can get a 10% discount with the SMB nation 2018 code. I also am teaching a class on service agreements for SMB consultants, applying the book. So that is a five week online course that starts January 31st. And so if you uh, go to greatlittleseminar.com, you can find out about that. Um, so I, I certainly appreciate the question. And you know, the, the intention of this was to give truly useful information, um, but obviously, you know, <laughs> I do have a book. So I'll be, I'll be happy to- Of course. To <laughs> Every speaker has a book. Hey, you know, Carl, and there's there's a little bit of truth to humor, but is is you know, I'm a fan of uh, uh, watching news at night. I I won't specify all the channels, but but I I do. I kick it relaxes me. And darn it, Carl, just about every talking head has a book. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> the well, see, I, you, you want to do the NPR thing, right? And milk that, and I. I want to be the, you know, the, the guest on the talk show that holds up my book. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, we have Ron Hardy from Gig Harbor, Washington asking, Ron is asking, how long should the contract be? How many pages 
Where do we address the details of expectations? Thanks, Carl and Harry. Uh, he goes, so, and Carl, by the way, he, he goes, Carl, forgive me, he goes on to say, or maybe the details and expectations uh, are the reason for the, uh, the, that the addendum, the addenda was uh, invented. You want to take it head on uh, in terms yeah, of link and where to have those conversations? We are going to dip a bit into some of the expectations in the next section, but um, you know, the I, again, I think my you know average contract that I've seen obviously depends on the you know I I like to use basic eleven point type you know uh, so don't don't do two point types let somebody actually be able to read it and depending on how many sections you have um, I, generally it's in the um, you know ten to fifteen page range you know I think uh, many contracts can be done in seven or eight and then you've got um, you know, a couple of things where you're going to put your service, you know, your actual current service offering as a, an amendment. Um, but, you know, a contract with a managed service amendment is going to be 10 to 15 pages. So roughly. And, you know, yeah. So, you know, part of what I do in my book is I go through all of the, I have what I call basically the service agreement construction kit, right? I go through paragraph by paragraph Here's this paragraph. Here's what it means in the real world. Here's why you should care, right? Um, here's why you'd put it in or don't put it in. And then here's the next one and the next one and the next one. And basically you pick out the ones you like. And then I've got a couple of, I think I have three or four different whole contracts that you can, you know, look through and, you know, but it's, it's like anything else. The reason you start with why this is your business is that you need to, um, you need to customize it for the way that you do business. And if you never do Haws or you never sell, uh, you know, software as a service, then don't talk about that in your contract, you know, so anything else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Carl, while we're kind of in this realm, Jason uh, Trong has asked, he, he has two comments. So um, is there such thing as a contract that's too long? I'm concerned about a contract that is too long and makes it, People feel there's no trust. Um, he goes on to say a minute later, Carl, when you say 10 to 15 pages, does that include the addendums? So yes. length of contract and and, and, and you're, I'm hearing you say the 10 to 15 includes the addendums. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, and, and again, you know, if, if I do my standard, like my standard contract, it's about seven pages plus addendum. So it turns out to be around 10. Um, in terms of it being too long, if you've ever had Sears come to your house and fix a refrigerator, <laughs> one of the things they do is the guy's got this printer on his belt and it's four inches wide and he prints out the contract for that refrigerator repair. And it is literally four feet long of two point type, <laughs> right? And it's on this, you know, this little sheet that's, um, you know, thermal print. So, uh, basically in a year it will cease to have exist you know so um so you know but people again in your daily life you you have all of these contracts they're everywhere are you know so the key to success is if your client knows you and likes you and trusts you they're gonna look you in the eye and say you know i'm taking your word that this is a good contract and you say yeah and they're gonna sign it my one of my two favorite clients of all time is an attorney who is happy to tell you over and over that he charges between four fifty and five hundred dollars an hour. Be, you know that's his range, uh, depending on what he's doing. And the last two times that I have slid a contract across the table, he looked me in the eye and said, "Is this just an excuse to charge me more money?" And I said yes, and he signed it. You know, I mean that that was the entire conversation from an attorney. So. If, you know, if your clients know you and they like you and they trust you, then, you know, in good faith, put together a contract that serves your purposes. Again, you know, at the end of the day, this is about solidifying a piece of the relationship that is really more about taxes and the IRS than it is about having good communications with your clients. Your clients are also being protected by this contract because of the way that you're looking at the, the taxes and the IRS and all of that. All right, anything else before we move on? No, sir. No, sir. Let's do it. Let's do it. 
All righty. So final things to consider. So we're going to look at service level agreements and, you know, uh, attorneys and so forth. Um, so let's start with service level agreements. The key here is service level. And so I never use SLAs. I have never signed an SLA. And so I don't like it when people use that term to mean service agreements or to mean contracts. A contract does not have to have performance requirements. It doesn't have to mention response times. It doesn't have to mention server uptime or any of that other stuff. Um, and in fact, I, I give it all the wording that you need, all the language for service level agreements uh, is included in my book, but I encourage you to not use it. If a client is not specifically asking for these things, don't put it in there. So, you know, a service level agreement, basically at the end of the day, it says, if you don't respond in a certain amount of time, you need to give us some of our money back. That's the agreement part of the service level agreement. Uh, and I'm not in the business of giving people their money back. You know, if I consistently don't deliver what I've promised that I'm going to deliver, well, then you need to fire me and you need to get somebody who knows what they're doing. Again, this is one of these things where at, con at uh, conferences and meetings and seminars, people talk about this all the time. And there are people giving advice into our community who have never actually run a managed service business. And they say, oh, this is a great selling point. You, you have a better SLA, you have a better response time than your competition. This is one of these things where people go off and they sell something and somebody buys it and they think that people bought it for the reason that they sold it. When in fact, if you ask your clients, they're never going to say, I need a response time requirement. Like there are seven people on earth who have ever asked for that in the small business space. It just is not something that clients worry about. They, they look at you and say, are you going to fix my stuff in a, in a timely manner? And you say yes. And they say, OK, right. You're, you know, this is not like, you know, back in the day, I used to run the internal tech support for HP's Roseville plant in Roseville, California. I managed a staff of 25 people and everybody had a pager. And your pager went off an hour before your ticket expired. And my pager went off a half hour before your ticket expired and when your ticket expired. So if you didn't meet those requirements, we, you know, we're, we're an outside contractor, right? We actually had to, we lost money, right? So the, the most important thing you could do if you're on my team is make sure my pager doesn't go off. In other words, you are required to meet those deadlines. Well, that is, that makes a bunch of sense when you've got a multi-million dollar contract with one of the top 10 countries in the world or top 10 businesses in the world. But when you're talking about, you know, you've got 25 people at a client and their printer isn't working, they just need you to fix their printer. And the, this whole thing of getting tied into service level agreements and all these requirements and, you know, putting, you know, time programming it into your PSA and all of that, I just think you should just ignore it. It's a, it's a layer of our business that you should not get involved with unless somebody specifically requests it. And do not, this is another example, don't have both sides of the conversation. Don't assume that your clients want this. If they don't ask for it, don't bring it up, don't offer it, don't make it by default an opportunity for you to lose money. That's, as you can tell, I just stepped off of my soapbox here, so. <clears throat> So the key word is level. What level of service can the client expect? What is a reasonable amount, right? What a response time. Um, and, you know, I just, I have a coaching client right now that man, he says all of these people they, what they expect as a response time is right now. Like I wouldn't have entered a ticket if I didn't want you to work on it right now. <laughs> right? Um, and so he's never had a service level agreement because every, if he offered it up, people would all say, well, I want, I will pay you more to make it faster, which is cool because he could keep raising his rates, but basically everybody wants everything yesterday. Um, and so if you have clients who are truly that unreasonable, you really need to avoid service level agreements. So 
Um, I love this quote, life is too short to be unhappy in business, right? So think about, you know, not just what you want to do, but what, why does your business exist? And Harry, to your point of, you know, that you want to hang out on the side of the road in Colorado, I got to tell you, um, if part of the reason that you're in business is to go skiing as much as possible, that's totally legitimate. Small businesses exist to support the goals and lifestyle of their owners, right? Uh -huh. It just, that's why small business exists, right? And you've done an excellent job. I, I see you giving ski reports all the time from the top of the mountain. Taking care of myself is, is one of the best things I do. <laughs> so, you know, and, and, you know, uh, you know, the whole thing of, you know, what, what do you want to do in terms of, do I want to, uh, you know, I was on the phone uh, webinar this morning with uh, Josh Peterson from Bering McKinley. And he was talking about, you know, he wants to improve the, the lives of 10,000 business owners. I think that's a great goal. Right. I mean, that is something it's it's not just, hey, I want to do good things for good people, but I'm going to put a number on it. You know, I'm, and and so, you know, there are people whose businesses exist so that they can put their kids through college, buy a vacation home, uh, go uh, on a regular trip to Bermuda or whatever, um, whatever you want to do with your business, support a charity, whatever. That is completely up to you no matter what your goal is, it's legitimate. And so you should really define your business to be the way you want it to be. And then go find clients that fit your model. You know, pretty much everybody on this call lives in a place where there's enough population that you are able to find people who want to do business the way you want to do business. And so, you know, don't be afraid to say, this is the way I want to do it. I always love looking at different business models that are out there. You know, you look at Safeway or Kroger's and you say, okay, that's how, that's one way of selling groceries. And then you look at Trader Joe's and it's completely the opposite, right? I mean, one is we want you to come in here seven times a day and we don't care if you use your visa to buy a stick of gum. And then the other one is, you know, we're selling olives for $10, you know, <laughs> like uh, who the hell does that? Right. But if you just find people who want to do business your way, you can have a very, very successful business. And so, you know, the, the, the service agreement is literally like this living document that defines this combination, the intersection between what you want to do and who you want your clients to be. Uh, with regard to the IRS. Uh, one of the things that you want to look into is, again, here's this, you know, I said, if you Google this, you'll, you'll be able to find it right away. Um, but look at some of the requirements of this, because it's very interesting. You know, um, part of it is that you might actually have some subcontractors that work for you that you need to turn them into employees because you're telling them where to go and what to do and all this other stuff. So you have to be careful about that as well. Um, but the bottom line I would tell you is don't mess with the IRS. And uh, I don't even know if you remember this, Harry, but this is probably, it might be 15 years ago, there was somebody making a presentation at one of the, your conferences about how to get around all the IRS and how to finagle these, all these kinds of things. And he was talking about how uh, his commute is from the top of his stairs to the bottom of his stairs. And then, you know, uh, what he, all the ways he messes with the IRS. And all I could think of is, man, uh, I, I want to be so far on the right side of the law when it comes to the IRS. Uh, I would never do half of the stuff that some of these people do out there. Um, you know, the IRS can literally destroy your financial life. So, um, just be very careful. And again, that's one of the strongest reasons for getting clients to sign a contract is that they need to be on the right side of the IRS. And, and you know, I always joke with my tax guy that, you know, this is, uh, you know, this late, latest tax bill is Hank's Full Employment Act, right? <laughs> People like him, Rayanne Buccianico, right? They're never going to lose work because the IRS is constantly changing the rules and Congress is constantly changing the rules. So be very careful about how you implement this.
Yep. Um, all right, so there's that. So uh, there's several pieces to looking at, you know, whether or not somebody is an employee. And one of them is, um, you know, do they have the right to uh, control the, the work, right? So if a client comes to you and says, um, I need you to have somebody sitting in this chair in this office uh, and using this program, you know, click, 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 click. Um, it's getting very, very close to being um, an employee relationship. Now, one of the ways you can circumvent that is a contract. There is a stipulation in the IRS that specifically says that there are certain things that if you sign a contract, then you don't have to worry about this. Um, and so in the big picture, if what you're doing is clearly uh, outsourced tech support, even if you put an employee in their office, if you've got a contract for that, then they become not an employee. And that's, you know, in some ways it's how the um, uh, employment agencies work, right? Is that they, they've got an employee that you buy as a quote unquote, as a service, you know, right? So people love this, everything as a service. Well, this is employees as a service. Um, it's also just kind of as a related matter, it's also possible for you to put something in your contract that says, if a client hires one of your employees, they have to pay you the equivalent of, you know, whatever you choose, three months, six months salary, uh, because they are using you as an employment agency. And so if you ever have the situation where you're worried that somebody, you know, some, some client is going to steal one of your employees, that's one way to deal with it. And, but you got to put that in the contract before you start doing work with them. All righty. So, okay. Hey, Carl, we got a couple, couple uh, comments. Um, Ron right. Hardy has two comments that from my land surveying business, I had a two page eight point legal paper contract, which covered the basics. And then basically, uh, the details were sketched out in the addendum or a letter of understanding. Jason says, thank you. Alan Brinker asked for slides. Carl, I believe you're comfortable releasing your slides as part of our thank you. Sure. Let me give you my uh, PayPal account. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and then Ron yeah. Hardy comes back uh, with a paragraph. Um, Carl, I'll get that over to you, but it's basically just a, a, a thank you, Carl, for kind of inspiring them to think about personal goals and big goals and big dreams in addition to <laughs> the nuts and bolts of business. So my right, pleasure, my pleasure. I mean, I do have to say, if you haven't read Relax, Focus, Succeed, my personal mission statement in life is to help uh, myself and others by, you know, helping people through, you know, both their business and their personal life. So that's, that's why I exist. <laughs> So in terms of how you get started with all of this, uh, this is one of these things where you need to just basically go through an exercise. Um, look in your PSA, look in your QuickBooks. Do you have a paragraph at the bottom of an invoice that says uh, everything's due in net 20 days unless otherwise stated or net 30 days? Uh, do you have, you know, little things that you've signed with people? You know, what, whatever. Gather up all that stuff, right? You do actually, whether you've thought about it or not, you have a way that you interact with clients financially. You have a way that you service contracts. So even if you haven't thought about it formally, begin gathering up all that stuff, right? You've heard of the HP way, and we used to always literally have a thing called the KP Enterprises way. Uh, we have a way that we do business. So, you know, what does that look like? And that'll give you the the basic outline of, you know, what your contracts should include and what they shouldn't include. Um, and, you know, whatever you've got, put it in one place and start to make sense out of it. Uh, again, it's one of the things that might become obvious is you might have made two different statements about what your terms are or, you know, what the relationship looks like. So clearly you want to have just one statement of all of that. And um, then you might add things. For example, we sold programming for I don't know, more than 10 years. And so, you know, if you're selling programming, who owns that code? And um, you can have lots of different options. So again, my book talks about the, the different options and how you would word that. Hardware as a service. Um, again, if you still specialty items like backup and disaster recovery, 
you know, there's different kinds of pieces that might get bolted on or that will be part of a separate contract. Um, I think a lot of uh, BDRs, because a lot of them involve, uh, and HAWs involve financing, they tend to be more complicated, right? And so we talk about the length of a contract, those contracts are going to be a little bit longer. Um, in terms of how many, so this is one where if, you, if you've actually got a PSA, I want your ears to perk up a bit. You're going to sign, in most cases, two contracts. You're gonna sign your standard contract um, and then your managed service contract, okay? So uh, if, every, if something is covered by managed services, then it goes, it'll be charged at one rate. If it's not covered, it's gonna be charged at a different rate. In your PSA, you're probably gonna have three contracts. So you're going to first have a billable time and materials con contract. So um, we literally create a billable time and materials contract in the PSA for every single person that we've ever sold anything to, okay? So, if they if they are literally just break fix or they've just got a you know a one time uh, thing going on, then uh, all their work goes on the billable time and materials contract. If if a client is not on managed services, their default contract in the PSA is the time and materials contract. Um, and then the second contract is everybody who's on managed services will have a managed service agreement contract. And if you're on managed services, that becomes your default. So if something's covered under managed services, the ticket goes on that contract inside the PSA. If it's not covered by managed services, then it goes on to the billable time and materials contract. So, you know, again, just to repeat, if a client is on break fix, by default, everything's billable and it goes on the time and materials contract. If a client's on managed services, by default, they are not gonna get charged for, for stuff. So if it's billable, you move that ticket to their time and materials contract. And then a third contract you might have for some clients would be a flat fee. So a project labor um, is just what I'm calling it here, but basically that's your flat fee. So let's say you're going to do a migration to the cloud for $2,500, okay. So you've got a service ticket that is for that um, and you might sign, you, you don't even have to sign a separate deal because you're gonna cover it under the signed contracts, but in the PSA, you put it as a flat fee contract and that way all of the work gets billed towards that contract in the PSA and um, then you're gonna be able to track how many hours it actually took you to make that migration. And so you'll be able to determine the profitability of that contract. So again, you, you're gonna have one contract in the real world, which is managed services or break fix, just a standard contract um, with a managed services agreement or uh, amendment. <clears throat> but you're going to put three contracts into your PSA just in terms of tracking uh, the profitability of each of those uh, areas. Uh, and again, hey, if Carl, you have questions, Carl. I'll answer them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no questions, but let me let me just offer a comment that with that last part about project work. So in the world uh, that SMB Nation has a foot in called publisher or, or media integration company, I mean, we do, we, we do a, a few things, but one of our feet, I guess we're a centipede, um, one of our feet <laughs> is a publisher. And so we would call those campaigns, but it's the same idea. It's the same right. idea as a project, right? Exactly. So, anyways, I just connecting some dots. Please continue. All righty. Uh, so, in terms of getting help, um, I the the three kinds of help I just think absolutely everybody should get are legal, um, insurance, and taxes. So, you know, so sl taxes slash financial. Uh, on the legal side, here's the deal: if you went to an attorney without a template. If you just went in and said, let me explain managed services to you. <laughs> let me explain IT consulting. They're literally gonna go into some service that they have subscribed to. They're gonna do a search for a service contract. They're going to download that and they're gonna make changes per your discussion. Uh, they're gonna charge you by the hour and um, they're gonna come up with a contract that was not designed for IT. It might even be 
based on um, roof repair or uh, HVAC or lawn maintenance for all you know. Um, so whether it's mine or other service agreement contracts that you can find samples of, it's far better for you to you know, put together something, even if you don't buy my book, even if you literally just, you know, take all the ideas from this uh, hour and a half and write out your ideas of what it should be, the, the lawyer will turn that into a contract and save you a bunch of money. Now, if you hand them a perfect legal agreement, they are, they are required by uh, the oath that they took to make changes and to that in order to justify their bill. So you could literally, you know, take a, a contract to a lawyer here, have them look at it. They're going to make some changes, take it across the street. That guy's going to make some changes, take it back to the first one. They'll make some more changes, right? It's just, it's what they do. So, um, you know, just assume that that's going to happen. The important thing is that you want to make sure that everything in your um, service agreement is enforceable is legitimate in your state and that you don't have two things where you've accidentally uh, say one thing at the beginning and another thing in the middle and they, you know, cancel each other out. So, you know, you do want a valid enforceable contract. And so um, the best way to save money is to take a template or to take something to your attorney and make sure that it's legal. Um, and, you know, even with mine, I can tell you, okay, my, the, the contract that I give you was reviewed by an attorney in the state of California. That's cool if you live in California, but uh, I, I missed the article this year, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 different laws went into effect January 1st, and more will go into effect, you know, July 1st. So, you know, these things change every day, every month. You know, some judge makes a decision and it changes the way these are implemented. You do need an attorney to review your contracts, period. Yes, it costs money, um, but it's a one-time deal and then you're good to go. Um, in terms of insurance, <clears throat> you know, again, looking at finances, looking at liability, looking at relationships. Um, I've, I, again, never been sued by anybody, but you know, I've had idiots working for me. I've had people drop computers on people's desks. I've had people drop computers on somebody's foot. You know, I've had technicians who cut themselves opening a computer. You know, all kinds of stuff can happen. You need insurance. It's a pain in the neck. It's a fact of life. Um, and, you know, we, our, our industry probably has the, the smallest incident of actual injuries and problems of pretty much any industry out there. Um, but you just never know what's going to happen and you have to be careful. And you read stories in the news all the time of, you know, people, employees who do stupid things and they don't come to you and say, hey, can I install this program on all of our computers, uh, all of our clients to uh, turn on their cameras so I can look and see what they're doing at home? No one's ever going to ask you that. Right? <laughs> So, you know, you, you have to protect yourself from stuff. So, you know, check out the insurance thing. Uh, in terms of taxes, again, uh, I, I have to say, I, my mom and dad owned a tax preparation business. They were both enrolled agents. Enrolled agents can legally represent you to the IRS without you being there. Um, you know, and, and I, what I learned out of all that is I'm smart enough to do my own taxes but I'm smart enough that I don't, right? I literally, I pay somebody to do my taxes and it has saved me tons and tons of money. Um, and also accountants are really good business advisors kind of generically. That's been my experience is if you, if you can get your accountant to, uh, to let you buy them lunch, they will give you all kinds of education on how to run your business and um, you know, the kinds of things that they see because they see, way more stuff than you ever see when it comes to taxes and uh, and questions about how a business should be run financially. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, you want to look at uh, what does this, what does a service agreement do for your business? It should bring value. It should, you know, you're going to spend a couple hundred bucks or 300 bucks, whatever, on an attorney to approve this thing. Um, it should bring some value. It should it should help you with your taxes. It should help you with your client relationships. It should help you with, if nothing else, just the security, knowing that you've got your 
you know, back end covered with regard to many of the issues that we talked about today. And remember that, you know, at the end of the day, if the relationship with your clients is good, a contract is irrelevant. And if a relationship with your client is bad, there's a limit to how much even a written contract is going to do, you know, so keep it in perspective. I think it's useful and I, I think it's necessary, but you know, it, it's, it does a limited number of things for you. Just make sure that it does those things. Carl, what, what, what I would add, we are at time and thank you for, uh, uh, participating in winter quarter. We'll see you. by the way, Carl, we'll see you back at spring quarter mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and beyond. Um, and, and what I would add uh, to, to, to this conversation about contracts and stuff is you can actually turn this into a strength. And here's what I mean is that um, uh, again, uh, my storytelling is that of startups and Really, the first time I got really, really serious about an operating agreement and article of incorporation and that kind of thing was, you may recall our uh, 24-month venture in Cloud Nation back in 2011. Um, Did You know, bottom line is, like many startups, it didn't go as well as we'd hoped. Uh, You know, that's how the game's played. But we did engage an attorney and really had a, a killer operating agreement and so on, <clears throat> to which I still have. It's in my file of, of contracts. And folks, I guess my feeling now is um, two things. When a startup proposition crosses my desk, um, I can respond very quickly with an operating agreement. And Carl, that's the kind of document that spells out a 10% option pool and, 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 and that kind of thing. Um, and, and what happens if I go, go off a cliff while skiing and yada, yada, yada. Um, but you, can, you, 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 you kind of get good at it. I mean, does that make sense? When you do this yeah. a lot, you kind of get good at it. And then conversely, I'm surprised at how many people are bad at it. <laughs> people who do startups, right? I'm like, really? I mean, exactly. you, you, you don't really know what you're doing. And then Carl, I'll end on this. Finally, I guess I had a third point is that I don't, I don't pass go without an operating agreement. I mean, there are so many startup ideas. The next great thing, our big idea. Uh, no, if, if we don't have, I'm not putting one hour of effort into this startup until I have an operating agreement. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, yeah, and Carl, you and I know some people, won't name names, but they, they had promises made that, oh, yeah, the stock option agreement's coming. I've just been a little bit busy. I haven't been able to get it to you. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, they, uh, they, they say the, uh, uh, a, an oral agreement is not worth the paper it's written on. So, Yeah. Uh, Carl, we're at time. Give it your best shot. All righty. So uh, I, I'll just give you my plug and then we'll, we'll do the other plug. But basically, I do have this five week class service agreements for SMB consultants starts January 31st. It's uh, for five weeks. Uh, there's massive amounts of uh, handouts and the price of the class includes the price of the book. So you'll get the PDF of the book if you buy the class. Um, it's two fifty nine a student minus your SMB Nation discount, just put in the code SMB Nation 2018. Woo-hoo! That's at greatlittleseminar.com. And um, I, I'd love to have everybody on this call uh, join us there and, and maybe ask some more questions. And finally, we want to thank Fortinet one more time. Absolutely. And Carl, let me just look over. Ron Hardy, you sure are chatty down there in Gig Harbor, but basically. I, I, almost, all I, you know, I almost want to say shout out to Fortinet for getting the Steelers. That's kind of cool, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So, so what's with Ron? Uh, I'll end on this. Ron says, Harry, you're making a good pitch for getting the uh, the MBA degree. Ron, not, not I, I mean, thank you, and I'm a believer in education, trust me, but um, take Carl's class. Another another thing you might consider, guys, because Carl is, is in our uh, sector, if you will, but Carl, there's a really good um, program by Seth Godin called the Alt-MBA, that's Alt-MBA, Google it. 
and it's it's sort of like a practical uh, teamwork case study MBA for the rest of us that that really don't want to invest the time or money for a two year um, degree that may or may not make sense in the real right. world. So with well, that, I love, said, I love pretty much everything by Seth Godin. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, rock star. Thank you very much, folks. We'll see you next Wednesday when I am the speaker on the MSP Tech Talk with analytics for MSPs. And next Thursday, we have our friends at Intuit talking to us about business workflow. Thank you very much. Use the SMB Nation 2018 code for your work with Carl. You get a thank you letter with the deck. Have a great day. All right. Thank you all.